Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this week's uh, professional lecture uh, from an elephant professional lecture, I think we can call it, but the professional lecture uh, from here in the far north of Thailand, um, in the Golden Triangle of Thailand. Uh, as the sun is going down, I can't see any elephants down there, but, but here we are um, talking about elephants and this week actually talking about something slightly different, which is the, the wildlife trade or the illegal wildlife trade. And very, very hot topic at the moment, or at least it should be. It should be a much hotter topic than it actually is. Um, because basically, we're all in a bit of a mess around the world, as you may have noticed. And uh, uh, it was the, the wildlife trade or the illegal wildlife trade, trade and the consumption of wildlife that got us here, um, people, people consuming wildlife. Um, and I've been involved a little bit, and many other people have been involved through the tourism industry and various other industries in trying to stop this um, in various uh, various levels. But one of the things that we have come to the conclusion you can you can have guns and guards as we do in Cambodia to try and uh, to try and stop the poaching. Uh, you can try and intercept shipments as they cross across uh, uh, national boundaries or where they get picked up in checkpoints and all sorts of other things. But the most, the thing we all agree that has to be done most importantly is uh, is we have to stop the, co the consumption. We have to stop the market. When while people still want to consume wildlife uh, and parts of wildlife, somebody will find a way of supplying that demand. So demand reduction is one of the, the key things. It's kind of the holy grail for us all. And today I am delighted to say for actually one of the, as I have done several times in this session, uh, one of the one of the people who came to us early in their career um, ha and has gone on to great things. So I'm delighted to introduce uh, somebody who spent some time with us at the Think Elephants Research Assistant is now Dr. Newly minted Hun Dr. Hunter Dougherty um, from the University of Oxford. And she ha is going to talk to us today about a groundbreaking study she managed to do in Singapore, although from Oxford, I think somewhere pre pre virtual studies before we all had to go virtual. Um, about using the strategic advertising of online news articles to influence wildlife trade consumers. So using the uh, using Facebook and social media against the villains. So uh, without further ado, I will hand over to Hunter and she will tell us all about it. And then we will open the Zoom room to questions and and the people can answer direct or ask questions directly there. And then we'll have other answers coming from the Facebook. So Hunter, welcome. Welcome back to Great. the Golden Triangle, albeit yeah. virtually. Um, and please yeah. tell us all about it. Congratulations also on your on your new on your new newly minted PhD. Well, thank you so much, John. And it's really lovely to be here and to be virtually back in the Golden Triangle. And yes, I'm going to be talking exactly about what you've been speaking of, of using strategic advertising of online news articles to influence wildlife trade consumers. And this was a study that I did for my doctoral work. And um, so it's been the last four years of, of research in Singapore. So this was recently published as a, a paper in conservation science and practice. So you're welcome to look that up. It was done by myself and a number of lovely co-authors both here in the UK and in Singapore. So setting the scene a little bit, John was already doing that for me so graciously. So the unsustainable or, or, and or illegal wildlife trade is a globally pervasive issue. It affects countless species all over the globe, and that includes humans, as we've seen with this global pandemic. Um, even if COVID wasn't directly caused by, you know, linking from eating bats or something like that, it is this sort of transfer of wildlife and wildlife consumption that has caused many pandemics like SARS outbreaks and Ebola and even AIDS. So it's something that's that's quite prevalent and that has happened for many years now. So in order to combat wildlife trade, there are a number of things, as John mentioned, that we can do in order to sort of uh, reduce this impact. And one of them is reducing consumer demand. And this has been kind of recognized as a key component to long-term change. And unfortunately, we still only have about 4% of conservation funding, according to the World Bank, that's going into demand reduction. But most of this has been in the form of behavior change interventions. So behavior change intervention is anytime uh, you are making a, a concerted and systematic effort in, uh, in order to, to intervene on someone else's behavior. Now, many of these interventions 
in wildlife trade have been in the form of campaigns. So these are things that you see like Jackie Chan with a pangolin up on a billboard or Yao Ming telling you not to buy shark fin. And they're also non-celebrity. Um, sorry to, just very quick. I don't know why it still doesn't come through Facebook. So John just reset something. Just, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it started, it's your life, but then I don't see it on our Facebook. Mm -hmm. I'll let you guys figure that out then. <laughs> Sorry. Or oh, John, you and her to continue and you can post the link later. Okay, I'm sorry, I will call John, please might not hear me. Okay, yeah, just let me know if you, I can wait a minute if you'd like. Okay. No, no Hunter, go ahead. Um, I think I've restarted it. If it doesn't work again, I'll post the link later. Okay. Oh, now it's coming. Do you want to start everything again or? Um, is it posted now? Uh, it's posted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe start from the beginning, Hunter. Sorry, everybody on Facebook. Um, I had a little bit of a technical issue. We'll start with, with I won't do my intro. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Hunter Gallagher. <laughs> Sorry guys, if you're just joining us, and sorry if you're if you're going to hear these next two slides over, don't worry, it's not too much repeat. But yes, my name is Hunter Dowdy, and I'm at the University of Oxford, and I'll be speaking today about my work on using strategic advertising of online news articles to influence wildlife trade consumers. So this work can be found in a paper that was published in Conservation Science and Practice, and our co-authors are both here in the UK and also in Singapore. Okay, so setting the scene a little bit, particularly for those who are just joining us, uh, we know that the unsustainable and our legal wildlife trade is a big problem. It affects both species, uh, non-human species, as well as humans. And this has in the form of human livelihoods and health as we're seeing from this global pandemic underway. So in order to reduce illegal wildlife trade, there has been a, a big push for reducing consumer demand. And that's because we know that if you, if you stem something from the root of the problem, then you're, you're not going to have to keep dealing with the, the symptoms of that problem, which are things like poaching on the other end. Because as John mentioned previously, um, before the live link went up, was that it, all it takes really is for one person to want to poach an animal for them for that animal to potentially be poached. But if you don't have any consumer demand, then you don't even have any issue with those poachers that you have to deal with. So sort of like stopping the problem before it even gets to the animal. And we've seen this big push for behavioral interventions, which is essentially a way that you're intervening on someone else's behavior in order to reduce consumer demand. Now, most of these have been in the form of campaigns. So billboards or commercials, things that you see up often with celebrities or with catchy phrases, um, bright colors, uh, WWF, um, traffic, wild aid, bird life international. There's quite a few NGOs that have put out many campaigns in the last few years. Now, as opposed to these campaigns, though, there is a number of other ways that you can intervene on someone else's behavior. So in truth, if you were to look in a field like public health or uh, behavioral economics and social marketing, intervening, quote unquote, on someone's behavior usually comes in a multitude of fashions. And these can be as big or as systemic as something like introducing new school curriculum across a country, or they can be as subtle as just renaming a product on a menu. And that would be a type of nudge where you're changing the, the setting in which a behavior is occurring and that can nudge someone to making a different choice. So just showing that there's, there's a multitude of ways that you can intervene, even if in wildlife trade, we've traditionally been very limited to one form, which isn't necessarily the best thing to use. 
So in addition to sort of this limitation of, of um, types of interventions, we've also seen quite a lot of critique around the development, the design, and the evaluation of wildlife trade interventions. Um, and so we have this big push for a need for strategic, effective, and evidence-based methods to influence target consumers. And there has been a number of efforts in recent years, especially in terms of understanding wildlife consumers that is moving towards this far more evidence-based practice. So it's kind of like the, the giant push of a wave that's currently happening in conservation. And that's because we know that when something is done well, and this has been shown time and time again in things like public health interventions, then we're more likely to actually get the goal that we want. If we do interventions more carefully, then it's money better spent. So the case study that I'll be talking about today is the Saiga antelope. So saigas are about two to three feet tall, this small little antelope that lives in the steppes of Central Asia, like Russia, Russia Kazakhstan, um, um, Mongolia, and they have been massively impacted due to poaching. So in the 1990s, following the fall of the USSR, we saw a dramatic decrease in saiga populations due to selective poaching for their horns. In fact, they lost about 95% of the population in just about a 10 year span. So that's a massive species reduction. And then in the last 10 years, we've seen this problem be even further exacerbated due to disease die-offs. So in 2015, we had one of the largest die-offs in which about two thirds of the remaining population was wiped out in, in, just, in just a few weeks actually. So it's been quite bad. This, this, they've kind of had a bit of insult to injury on this poor species. So why are these animals actually even being poached? Well, they're poached for their horns because the horns themselves are used in traditional Chinese medicine. And they're used to treat things, a number of things, um, two of the biggest being fever and heatiness. Heatiness is a, a TCM state of illness with symptoms similar to the Western cold. So sore throat, cough, congestion, but these are kind of the, the Westernized definitions, I guess you could say. Um, it really has to do more with, if you were to look at it from a TCM perspective, it's a little bit different, but I think that's what makes most sense to um, maybe someone who doesn't necessarily use TCM. So Singapore is actually one of the largest consumer countries of saiga horn. And within country, it is totally legal to purchase. And therefore, <clears throat> sorry, to consumers, it is non-sensitive. So if you were to walk into a shop and ask for saiga horn, it is just the item on the shelf. It's like buying Panadol or buying Advil. It's just a medicine in the medicine cabinet that the consumer is purchasing, which also makes it an interesting case study for conservation. And I think a good example of many wildlife products because we have this tendency to think that in conservation that if we care about it and that it's sensitive to us, that it must have the same perception um, in the eyes of the consumer. But often that's really not the case. In, in many or potentially most instances, the consumer is viewing this item in a completely different way. And they may have no idea that the animal is even threatened or should be considered sensitive in any way. So how do you purchase this product in Singapore? Well, the traditional forms of the product are actually these whole horns. So um, historically you would purchase a whole horn and then take that home to your family and you would shave off the, these little outer rings and go for just this, um, the outer sheath of the bone here. You would shave those off with glass, interestingly enough, and then you would boil that product with different herbs for many hours potentially, and then drink that to um, abate your symptoms. Now, you can buy the whole horns now, or you can buy the horn shavings, which often come uh, accompanied by a number of herbs. There's some in the bottom of this container here. Or the really modern forms are that you can buy it pre-boiled and often served chilled for you. Or you can take that pre-bottled version and they can be dehydrated down into capsules. So these are two a little bit more traditional forms and these are two far more modern forms, something that you might see in a normal you know, Western pharmacy, for example. 
So we'll take that case study and we're going to overlay this system of developing a behavioral intervention and implementing and evaluating it. So this was the full project and I just wanted you to understand that the intervention itself that I'll be speaking about today is just one step of this much larger project. So this intervention development half actually took about two and a half years of work before we ever even implemented. And I just want to kind of show that these, these processes do take time. Um, so the empirical evidence stage, which I, and the comprehensive understanding bit, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, just to give you some context, but we'll, we'll obviously be really focusing on the intervention itself today. So this intervention development process. So we found through um, an extensive set of consumer surveys, so about 2,200 in-person surveys stratified across uh, socioeconomic level, time of day, day of week, really trying to get an accurate perception of the consumers in Singapore. We found that about 19% of Chinese Singaporeans were considered high level Saiga users. And this meant that they considered Saiga horn to be a product they use most often when treating things like fever and heaviness. So not just, I used this once when I was 12 and haven't used it since, but this is my go-to product when, I'm, when I am feeling this way, which is quite impressive. That's a, that's a fairly high level consumption when you're talking about a species kind of on the brink of extinction. And another interesting thing that we found in this survey um, was that users were more likely to mistake saiga antelopes for being common in the wild. So we actually flipped the question and instead of saying which of these species are rare, which has a tendency to bias people to answering more things are being rare and may and ask the far more conservative assessment of which of these are more common or which of these are common in the wild. And then we could get um, basically a conservative assessment of what consumers thought in terms of animals being common or rare in the wild. And interestingly enough, saiga horn or saiga, yeah, saiga horn users were were more likely to think that saiga antelopes were being common, were common in the wild. And so they were less likely to be aware of their conservation status. We also found that the largest consumer group was middle-aged individuals, which is maybe not too surprising in that people think of wildlife consumers often in the traditional Chinese medicine, sometimes being of the older generation, but it was surprising that it wasn't necessarily the older group it was actually the middle-aged group. And within that middle-aged group, it was women of, of this group that were most likely to purchase saiga horn for both themselves and other people. And it does kind of make sense if you look at Singaporean society and that other studies have found that women are the most likely individuals to purchase medical or other types of items for their family members. So these middle-aged women were purchasing products for their potentially older relatives like their parents and their younger relatives like their children. So we decided that given these women were sort of at the heart of the influence, they were the ones that were using it themselves a lot and also purchasing for other people, that we would focus on middle-aged women for, as our target audience. And then through an additional set of um, focus groups and interviews along with quite a lot of research into social psychology um, theory, which I'd be happy to discuss with anyone after it if you're interested. We put together a few key factors around what was influencing this target audience's behavior. And the first of which was maybe none too surprising was that cyborg use was heavily influenced by social endorsement. And this included both interpersonal endorsement, so your direct social network, and it included social level perceptions. So you think that saiga horn is a common product used by Singaporeans and it is socially endorsed and thus you think that it's an appropriate product for you to use. So it's a social perception that's influencing your own behavior. So kind of both direct relationships and also just perceived social norms. And that's useful for us because perceived social norms are just as they say, perceived. So if you can potentially shift that perception, then you can leverage it for conservation. 
The second thing we found was that our target audience was gaining health information from impersonal content. And one of those was news articles. So impersonal content would be things like TV ads or anything you see online or news articles. And we found that in general, Singaporeans, and this isn't through just our research, this is past research as well, that Singaporeans tend to trust news articles more than maybe other countries. And that's because the news outlets are heavily regulated by the government. So the perception is that if a news information was inaccurate, then it wouldn't allow it to be published. So there was this kind of general underlying perception among our target audience members um, that news articles were more trustworthy than potentially other sources because they were government regulated. And we found that our target audience was using the internet for both social exchange and accessing impersonal content. So for us, the internet was an accurate channel to be able to leverage social perceptions as well as leverage things like impersonal content and news articles. <clears throat> Sorry, a little bit of a tickle in my throat. So a bit more information. So once we did that, we carried out a second set of focus groups. Oh, lots of baseline work here. <laughs> And we found that our target audience heavily identified with the message that Singaporeans strive to be health conscious and responsible consumers. So not necessarily that every Singaporean thinks that they're a responsible consumer, but in general, our target audience identified that that's what they strive to be. They also felt that when we presented them with very neutral information, neutrally framed information, about Lin Yang or saiga horn as coming from a critically endangered antelope, they felt that this misaligned with this self-identity that they had, which is really a societal identity. They felt like it didn't actually jibe with Singaporeans being um, health conscious or responsible consumers. And so it created a bit of what we'd call cognitive dissonance when something you feel about yourself and an action don't really connect. So we took that information and we created a core message for our intervention. And that was that Singaporean researcher and news outlets were exposing that numerous consumers in Singapore are knowingly using a critically endangered species. So it kind of maybe seems like a lot packed into here, but we'll unpack this. So the reason why we chose Singaporean researcher and news outlets is because for one, as we've said, we know that they trust news articles. And we also found through our focus groups that Singaporeans tend to prefer, or are within our target audience, preferred Singapore-based messages over um, global-based messages. So for example, they would prefer the Straits Times, which is a newspaper in Singapore, over BBC News. They also trusted Singaporean researchers more than researchers from Oxford. So our intervention message was centered around our Singaporean collaborators, Nanyang Technological University, as opposed to being centered around Oxford-based researchers. So we really focus in on which messengers were most useful and most trustworthy to our target audience. And another aspect of this is that it's, so it's Singaporean individuals who are exposing this kind of unwitting information about um, Saiga Horn. And that comes from this idea that the information was not jibing with their self-identity. So we were basically exposing this product as not, not aligning with this identity that we knew they already held about themselves and that it was coming from Singaporeans and so that it was thus Singaporean endorsed. So once again, this message implied that based on this quote unquote new information on the source of Saigahorn, its usage was no longer socially endorsed, that it was Singaporeans being upset about the fact that this product was coming from an endangered species and they didn't know. We also made sure that we were not targeting TCM on the whole through this message. So as you can see, it's all structured around 
just the source of Cygohorn. It's in no way saying that TCM is bad or good or that you should or shouldn't use it. It's really just saying that this product doesn't have the source that you think it does or the, the responsible source that you think it does. And to ensure that we weren't targeting TCM, we did make sure that any of the alternatives that were suggested were already within use of TCM users in Singapore. So there were things like chrysanthemum tea, ginseng, or goat's horn. So either cultivated or farmed um, species. So <clears throat> we took that development bit and then we wanted to create an intervention design. So for the design, we, we look to a few different pieces of science that have been, been researched in, in recent years, especially around the internet. So there is something called repeated passive exposure. And we know, maybe none too surprising to most people on this call, is that the more times you are exposed to an idea, even just passively, like it coming at you, the more likely you are to adopt that idea. And this is why, for instance, if you're on YouTube, YouTube will show you the same video over and over again, because they know that after you've seen it one or two times, um, or maybe three or four times, you're more likely to click on that video. Now, obviously, there's an arc, there's a point of saturation, but there is still this increase in likelihood for, for quite a few repetitions. Now, this stands in contrast to something like a simple contagion. So a disease, for instance, often requires you to only have one source of exposure in order for you to pick up that idea. But this could also be another sort of idea. If, if you have a friend who you really trust and they tell you a piece of information and it doesn't really go against anything that you hold near and dear to your heart, because you trust them, you're quite likely to just adopt or take on that idea because they've told it to you. So that would be a simple contagion. But if, for example, you really need to hear this idea multiple times and from multiple different sources, then we would consider that a complex contagion. And this is often the case when you're looking at something that is a very socially ingrained behavior or something that maybe goes against, <clears throat> goes against something that, that you feel strongly about. So if you have a very strong political view, for example, and someone was telling you something in contradiction to a politician that you like or admire, it would probably take quite a lot of ex repetitions of exposure from multiple different sources in order for you to potentially take on this new idea about this politician. Now, if those multiple different sources are people, if you need to hear this information from multiple people, we would say that this idea, <clears throat> sorry, this idea needs social reinforcement, which is hearing it from other people. Now, aside from passive exposure, there's also active exposure. So we as individuals have a tendency to look for information when we're interested in it. And this is often the case for health information and this was especially the case for our target audience of middle-aged women, that they were likely to go and look for information about their health when they were interested in knowing something. And research has found that in areas like health information seeking, that if you find ideas that are discoverable and attractive to you, then you're likely to act on those ideas, which means that from an intervention perspective, we wanted to try to harness both passive exposure and active exposure if we could. So the last thing we did was get ethics approval. <clears throat> and I think this is worth saying given all of the craziness in today and the, the impact of these types of techniques is that we did get this work approved through the Oxford Internet Institute and that any of the data analysis you see was done through review board approved web scraping. And I'm happy to talk more about any of those processes as well. <clears throat> so what did the intervention process end up looking like, our intervention design? I know this looks like a lot, but I will walk through it. So first of which, we took this core message, which was again, Singaporeans exposing psychohorn as coming from this endangered species. And this implied, once again, that Singaporeans were endorsing the message and that other users would want to know about this information. 
And we took that core message and we worked with a news outlet called the Straits Times, which was the most trusted news outlet in Singapore, according to our target audience. And we had worked with them to publish a news article discussing this core message. So then as this core message or was disseminated through this news article, it was picked up by subsequent news articles. And these were through things like the new paper, um, at least two Chinese language sources, which is Lion City News, China Press, and then a few other um, English news sources as well. So we took that news article and then any subsequent news articles and we promoted those through targeted advertising. And this enabled us to get at something like passive exposure. So through Facebook, Google, and Outbrain, we promoted advertisements that linked back to these news articles. Now, Facebook is particularly useful at both information dissemination as well as social sharing, which helps get at that social reinforcement that we thought might be useful since our um, since our Saigohorn product we know is socially influenced. So Facebook allowed for information dissemination as well as, uh, and this diverse repeat exposure as we've said, and as well as social sharing. Google is quite useful because it once again allows for passive exposure, but it also allows for active information seeking. So this is the second half of dissemination. So we not only wanted to passively expose people to this, but as we've said, we wanted to actively have this information available to those who are looking for it. So if you are looking for information and you go on Google, for instance, and type in, you know, Ling Yang, which is the name for Saigahorn, Ling Yang TCM, and you are in Singapore during this time in our target audience, then you would be likely to, to see that information. You would be likely to see one of our adverts that was promoting a news article. Similarly, Outbrain is a seller of third-party ads. Basically, they put ads on other websites and their big thing is using native ads. So a native ad is an ad that in theory looks similar to something that, that is already on the page. It looks organic. And an example of this would be if you were reading a news article on say exercise and you got to the bottom of that article, there would be oftentimes suggested articles that you may want to click on. Now those are usually adverts. They sometimes look like they're being promoted by the website and sometimes they are, but they might be peppered with adverts as well. So that was a type of native ad. So this means that we could get passive exposure and we could also get people who are maybe already looking at articles who were related to our um, to our product. And then lastly, we added in some uh, types of support sources. So anything that was related to our, our initial news outlet, we called seed sources. And anything that was not related to our initial news article, we called support sources. So this would be articles that say were published a few years ago or were just sort of random bits of information on different websites, but that corroborate our core message. So this was useful for us because we felt like if someone were to go on Google, for instance, and search for information as to whether or not our news articles were accurate, we wanted them to see support sources that would vet our article. We were basically trying to make sure that they saw articles that we wanted them to see that would corroborate our message, which I will say that hasn't been said is all accurate information. So we were very careful to make sure that our initial seed source and that any of our adverts was not promoting any deceiving or misleading information. Everything was accurate to, to the species and, and where it came from. So this gets at, lastly, just to recap, we had information seeking behavior, so this active exposure. We have diverse repeat exposure, which is passive and could also be active. And we have the social sharing or um, which benefits social reinforcement of the message. So this is a lot <laughs> kind of packs in here. 
And this is what it ended up looking like. So these are some of the news articles. This was an infographic done by Nature Society Singapore that they put out on their Facebook. And you can see that, you know, they're often pulling from each other. So you see similar images being used, um, different products that pop up in different places. And then the adverts, at least on Facebook, looked like something like this. So once again, we have this infographic and then we have all of these different news articles, um, adverts, and I will discuss those in seconds. So what was the reach of this? So we found that our message was published on at least five English and two Chinese language news outlets. It was also published on subsequent outlets, but these are the ones that came up in a, a proper timing for us to promote them in our intervention. And we also found that through just Facebook, because they were the only ones that gave us specific numbers of people, we reached about 480,000 women in Singapore in um, age 35 to 59. And this was about 809, this was, this was a little over 50% um, of the individuals who were, who were potentially able to see our adverts. So we got about 50% of the potential target audience on, on, on Facebook. Now across the three different advertising platforms, Google, Facebook, and Outbrain, we found that our adverts were shown about 5 million times. So this would be number of impressions. So these numbers are really big and they seem very exciting, but just to kind of re reiterate that this is just reach. So reach is basically just telling you message spread. Now, that in and of itself doesn't really do much, but it is useful metric in terms of magnitude of, of, of spread through a target audience. So it allows us to see on the back end, um, you know, if we have this, if we did or did not see a behavior change, we would want to know, like, were we actually pervading our, our target audience? Because if we only reached 10 people versus 10,000 people, and that's a very different evaluation that we're looking at. So in this way, it's useful to give you a backdrop, but on its own, it doesn't really say much. So what it starts to say a little bit more is when you look at um, advert metrics. So impressions being just the number of times an advert was shown, or as they say, the number of times adverts were served to individuals, as if it's on a platter for you. And this is just number of clicks. So this is the number of times that people click through an advert. But what starts to get interesting is when you look at these rates. So total CTR, so CTR is click through rate. So how many people click number, how many people clicked on ads versus the number of people who, or the number, sorry, the number of times adverts were clicked on versus the number of times they were shown. And here we can see that Google actually performed the best. So it was most likely for an individual to click on an ad on Google than it was on other platforms. And this isn't too surprising given the fact that as we've said, Google's really useful for getting at um, active information seekers. So someone was already potentially interested in this topic when they went on Google. So it's understanding that they would be more likely to click on that ad. But if we look over here at CPC or cost per click, we see that Google was really expensive. So some of our ads, one individual click, so one person clicking on one ad costs as much as 21 US dollars. So the average cost per click given our parameters of our adverts was quite expensive. Oh, sorry. But on Facebook, it was really cheap in comparison. It's actually the cheapest out of all of the three platforms. So when looking at cost effectiveness for our adverts, we would say that for passive exposure, Facebook was by and large the most cost effective platform because we still have a relatively high click-through rate if you compare it to something like Outbrain, but it is substantially cheaper than the other platforms. Now, if you were looking at active exposure, well, it would probably depend on your budget. Between Google and Outbrain, Outbrain has a really low click-through rate, but it's also much cheaper. So you might have to do something like that. But if you can afford it, you can work on Google. And we'll talk a little bit about, um, at the very end, I'll, 
I was going to mention that, you know, this really has to do with the keywords that you select. And so we'll talk about that at the very end. So in terms of reach, well, only Facebook gave us reach and frequency of exposure. And so once again, Facebook said that we reached about 480,000 individuals and that on average, any individual within that reach saw any number of our ads about seven times. So that's quite a high frequency of exposure for within the target audience. And, but for each ad, they only saw each, each ad on average about two times. Okay, so what do those ads look like? So on Facebook, which is what I'll be focusing a bit more today because it gave us a little bit more information. We were also able to, to look at things like text on the ads. But before we talk about that, I wanna mention what this advert looks like. So you'll see here that there is a sponsored link by Cyber Conservation Alliance. So the way that Facebook works is that the, the Facebook page promoting the advert has to be displayed on the ad. So for us, the Facebook page that we had access to that was relevant to this information was Cyber Conservation Alliance. And obviously you can see that that would have, that could potentially have a bias. Now, as we'll get into, we found through our results that it didn't actually seem to bias our, our study. And we think that is because the vast majority of this ad is, is information that is, is the information that individuals were paying attention to. And for example, you can see that in comparing between these two ads, and as we saw in any other um, sets of ads, the text that cited Chinese Singaporeans or Singaporeans was more likely to be clicked on than the text that didn't. So people were actually reading that text and if they saw something that was more relevant to them, they were more likely to click on it. And this is corroborating lots of past research around um, relevant message framing. And you can see here that the, the dark yellow ones, which is the Chinese Singaporean advert, it had a higher click through rate and you know was much less expensive and reached more people and had a higher frequency these types of things so on facebook as i mentioned facebook gave us a lot more information so the next two levels of analysis that we'll be looking at is the way in which you engage and then if you created any content if the user themselves sort of created any textual content in response to that message. So focusing first on these types of engagements, there's about four ways that you can, overall ways that you can engage with um, a Facebook advert. You can react to it, which is like if you like it or love it or put a sad face on it. Um, you can comment or respond to someone else's comment or share. You can share that. And you can either share that and add your own bit of text, or you can share that without adding any text, or you can click through on to, uh, click through the ad like you would on any other ad. So that engagement we thought was interesting. When, when overlaying the different news outlets, we see that different adverts acquire different, um, different types of engagements. So for example, the mothership advert had the highest number of clicks, shares, and comments, but actually relatively few reactions in comparison to Nature Society Singapore. So once again, the, the news outlet that was mentioned, even with all things else being equal, the news outlet that was mentioned was actually potentially more important to the user than say the promoter being from nature or being from Cyber Conservation Alliance. So it mattered more where the information, which news outlet the information was coming from. And then that second level of analysis was looking at user created content. So user created content would be anything that a user creates in response to this message. So like text, emojis, GIFs, stickers, um, I think that's it, oh, pictures. So anything like that, that you have added on as your response to this advert. And we found, which is kind of exciting, is that 63% of user-created content had identifyingly positive features. 
And what this means is that they were features that were either in line with the concert, in line with the message that we were promoting, or they were um, responding in the way that we wanted them to respond. So these pro messages in, or sorry, these positive messages in included things like general pro messages. And this was a little bit of a catch all for anything that was responding the way that we wanted to that didn't fall within these specific other categories. So this could be people saying that they were disgusted at seeing Saigahorn in, st in stores, that they were felt really guilty for drinking the product, that they were really sad about it. It was um, oftentimes prayers in support of living creatures. It was kind of a mix of different things. And they could be from a simple set of a few emojis to quite discursive texts about people giving you know, pro-conservation messages. Now, the next thing we saw was self-pledges. So self-pledges uh, are the only form of behavioral intent that we were able to assess through this part of the analysis. And that is basically a self-pledge is you saying that you're going to do something. You're going to, your behavior is going to be something in the future, which is a behavioral intent. And these for us were people saying things like they were either going to find alternatives or that they uh, weren't going to use this product anymore, these types of things. And another thing we saw was calls to action. So a self-pledge is talking about your own behavior, but a call to action is telling other people to do something. So these could be calls to the populace at large, telling them to stop drinking Ling Yang, or it could be calls to the government, telling the government that they need to ban it, or it was calls to big TCM stores like ZTP and telling them they needed to stop selling it. So those are kind of the three different types of calls to action that we saw. And lastly, some of these pro messages, or sorry, these positive features came from people personally calling out or responding to personal call outs. So a personal call out is when you put someone's name using the at symbol on Facebook. So you could say something like, oh my gosh, Jeff Doe, don't buy this smelly thing anymore and save them. And then Jeff Doe might respond at Jean Doe, okay, got it, prayer heart prayer sort of thing. So these were an, a real life exchange of individuals within an interpersonal network that you're able to see on Facebook, which is kind of cool. Now, we also had negative responses, which we expect. But interestingly, compared to the 63% that were positive, only 13% were identifiably negative. And the rest were neither identifiable as positive or negative. And the two biggest types of negative features that we saw were either the spread of misinformation or disinformation, uh, we're not sure, because um, you don't know if someone can, intends to spread this information or if they, and they think it's true or if they don't think it's true, but they still intend to spread it. So this would be people saying things like the animals were farmed, um, which isn't really true, or that the horns fall off and grow back or that all products in Singapore are now fake. So this was inaccurate information that was being spread um, against the, the message in the articles, or it was people who were referring to the efficacy of Saigahorn and they were getting quite upset at maybe thinking that this product would no longer be available and they felt that it was really useful or important, like maybe babies going extinct because they don't have access to this product anymore. So there was comments on efficacy and there was comments on um, misinformation. Those were the kind of the two types of general anti-messages that we saw most frequently. So what can we see and what can we not see with this portion of the analysis? So what we can see is that our intervention approach was valid. So the initial audience response through Facebook shows us that the intervention message was highly desirable and that, yeah, sorry, so the intervention response was highly desirable and that it indicated that the way in which we framed things and the channels that we use garnered us the desired reaction that we wanted within our target audience. And we also saw initial forms of you know, behavioral intent, so those self-pledges. 
But what we can't see through this analysis alone is behavior change. So this is not a measure of behavior change in itself. Through that, you need an offline, or for us, we conducted an offline evaluation following the intervention, and in we compared the behavior of our target audience with our non-target audience. And that paper is in press at the moment. But I'll give you a sneak preview in that we did see that the target audience was more impacted than the non-target audience. So these types of uh, techniques and approaches are quite powerful. We see them being used by private companies. We see them being used by politicians. We see them sort of infiltrating our systems all over the world, but we don't really see them being used for conservation. And even though they're really powerful, we wanna make sure that we're only using them when they're appropriate for our target audience and behavior. In our instance, our target audience used the internet for these different platforms and we had a very clear method to of um, social enforcement and um, yeah we basically knew that they used impersonal content and social enforcement via the internet and that allowed us to use these channels but even through our message had our target audience not responded in the way that we wanted or the way that they did to that potentially conservation message, we would have had to change that message and we would not have been using a seemingly conservation message, which really was a social endorsement message. So it's just showing you that they are powerful, but they have to be used when they are appropriate to your target audience and behavior. And they also require you to preemptively plan for evaluation. So as I said, we were able to see some very cool things and we could see that our intervention approach was useful and was garnering us a desired response, but it wasn't able to actually show behavior change. And on its own, it's very difficult to do that. The only exception that I can see that being is if you had click-through rate connected to say something like on-page donations on your website, then you could see directly, because you can link those uh, on things like Facebook, you can see if the rate at which people are clicking through different ads is connected to the rate at which people are donating on your website. So that would actually be able to show you behavior, behavior change. But for our study purposes on its own, we could not assess behavior change. Now when doing this, uh, this type of work through all, in, really any online channels, but definitely when using targeted advertising news coverage, there are a number of considerations to have. And one of this is that you have limitations in what you can control. There is, you know, there, is, yeah, there's, there's limitations in what audience you can have on different platforms. You may have things like timing limitations. So for example, when working with a news outlet, we were really at the mercy of their timing. If they didn't want to, um, if they didn't want to publish an article that week, we had to wait. And that's basically what happened is that we were sort of just like sitting ready until they published it and then we could start promoting adverts. And there's also differences across advertising platforms. So the way in which Facebook works is not the way in which Google works. And these get at the types of ad auctions that are kind of behind the curtain of how ads work. So on Facebook, you really need to think about which aspects you're using to uh, create your target audience and and also things like message framing and all of the other stuff that would go into it whereas on google for example you really need to think about which keywords you're going to use and if you choose a keyword that is maybe often used by big companies like the word fever which might be used by a company like panadol then you're going to have to pay a lot more for that keyword potentially than you would for a keyword like heatiness that isn't being used by major corp companies so these are all kind of things to think about and so with that there comes a really big learning curve for optimally using each of these platforms now if you were to use a platform like facebook for instance they have a, a learning platform called blueprint which i would highly recommend and it's free and it just has all of their classes as to how to use things like targeted advertising on their platform so i would just say that for people wanting to implement this work that you have to think about budgeting in some time and maybe some money for learning how to use these platforms in a way that's going to 
make your your intervention optimal because otherwise you're you know throwing money in an advert that isn't actually doing you as much good as that as it could and lastly there are obvious risks of unethical applications or negative impacts we know the power of these types of things and we want to make sure that if we're yield you know wielding these things for conservation good that we're actually doing it for good so testing 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 before you roll out anything and then testing while you're rolling it out and also carrying out evaluation is going to ensure that your messages are designed in a way that they're not going to have any mal impacts that you're not going to you know offend anyone or that you're not going to spread potentially misinformation and that you know on the on the back end that it's yeah that it's just garnering the response that you intended to garner and summing this all up, bringing it back to the kind of science that these types of techniques are based off of, we can see quite clearly through this work as through you know, other studies that diverse repeat exposure, social reinforcement, and information seeking can all be valuable intervention tactics. But we just want to make sure that they're used when they're, they're based on evidence and evaluation of your target audience. So I just want to say thank you so much for your time and I am happy to answer any questions. Hunter, thank you very, very much for that. Um, uh, fantastic, uh, fantastic work, all a bit scary, a lot of information to take in there, but um, uh, the, the techniques, as you say, are, are used. Um, so often we hear about them being used unethically. It's great to see them being used ethically and great them to be, to be used for, for the cause that we, we all believe in. Um, we may have to kidnap you a bit then and take you off to uh, as I as to take you off to be our fundraiser or something. Uh, just a, just a question, a couple of questions from me before we get into other questions. Um, the first question, when you say testing throughout, that's your, your testing, testing, testing. Is the, you're talking focus groups there? Are you mainly? Or? Yeah, yeah, okay. I think so. So I think focus groups, consumer survey. So I mean, the the three big ones that most people use are focus groups, conserver surveys, and key informant interviews. So those are three kind of big key tactics. And you often want to maybe use more than one. So we had survey, we actually had all three, but, and that can make sure that you're getting the, an accurate picture. But not just that, there's also, so there's empirical evidence, but then there's also all of the literature that's already out there on past studies and also on um, human behavioral theories. So a big influence in our work was overlaying something called social cognitive theory onto the data that we had. And that was essentially a bit of a test. If we were assessing what information we could see based off of this, um, this theory overlaid onto our data. And it gave us a much clearer picture of what was happening and how our audience was being influenced by the, you know, the social individuals around them and in, in, in specific ways. Okay, great. Um, actually, I think somebody's already asked my other question, so I typed it. Uh, would anybody, first of all, from the Zoom, like to unmute yourself and ask a question? If not, we will go to the Facebook questions. No? I see someone Zoom as well. Ah, yes, that, that, those are Facebook questions that, um, I don't know. Zach, do you want to unmute yourself or shall I read them? He's gone very quiet, so I will read them to you. So Carmen is asking, okay. and you can see them anyway, but Carmen is asking, did you get any pushback from the TCM industry and or particularly stubborn and defensive consumers? You touched on that a bit after she asked the question, but we may as well go ahead. And how did you handle them? Uh, it's a really good question. So our, our way to approach this was to involve people from the TCM industry as early as we could. So actually even our, on our very first scoping trip to Singapore, I was meeting with individuals in the TCM Alliance and um, the government, in, government individuals who regulate TCM products. So we wanted to make sure that this was done in a respectful way. And as we said, like we really did try to ensure that the message was targeting this this one product and not TCM on the whole, but it, it does happen. So we I would say we didn't see any formal pushback from anyone in the TCM industry, but in terms of consumers, if if you are feel very strongly about this product um, or about TCM in the general in in general, 
there is always that risk that you're going to think that this is kind of targeting something that you believe strongly in. And we did see that within that 13%. So there were individuals um, who would say things like, why, you know, why is everyone banning this TCM product and that TCM product? And, and you could tell that their response to the message wasn't even really about specifically Cygohorn, but it was really about them feeling like TCM was under attack. So it was something that we tried to avoid, but we knew that there was probably going to be some individuals who still interpreted it that way because they, they do feel so strongly about TCM and they felt like this system is, is maybe not being um, respected as much as they, as they wanted to. So we did see it a bit and we tried to mitigate it as much as possible, but um, yeah, it does happen. Um, and yeah, so that's how we handled them. And you also know that likely an intervention like this is not going to work on those on those individuals, and that is actually what we saw in the follow up evaluation. Was that if you have if you know the, the people who who knew the intervention message, they recalled it, they and didn't change their behavior, they were significantly more likely to have put their foot down and said, "Well, that's because I believe that this product is so it works so well." So like there was social endorsement was not going to change their behavior. <clears throat> yes, and I think similar things have been found also with um, with users of Tiger Bone and and others who've just there there are there's a certain core of the of the users who just don't care and they use it because they're and they're not going to change their mind. Um, um, so with, with with other techniques that have been used. Okay, so um, Zach is asking, do you have any plan to repeat the test inside the Chinese firewall with Weibo and WeChat and 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 others? Mm -hmm. It's a really good question. I think it, it would be very cool, but as we have come to kind of see through this intervention development framework is that an intervention should, should really be the end product of a bunch of work that you've done. So it's very possible that these techniques could be applied elsewhere. And actually that's why we're giving talks like this is we think these techniques can be applied elsewhere, but we would just wanna make sure that they were used because they were appropriate to that system. So if Cygohorn users, for example, in, in China, were not really using the internet for this type of exchange, then it wouldn't be an appropriate method to use. But if we conducted you know, baseline work and we found that it was appropriate, then I would say like definitely it would be a very cool um, plan to, to repeat and to use different platforms, like you're mentioning Weibo and WeChat. And presumably the baseline work, if it wasn't pointing to the internet, could point to other other places where you could you could push your information out. So it's a eventually, if you keep doing this, you could get a toolkit for for how you start and how you do the baseline work. Definitely. I mean, and this is if you look, you know, in conservation, we, we are very sort of new to, to this field, really, of behavioral interventions. But if you look in fields like public health or development, they've been doing this now for a few decades. So they have a much stronger foundation of, of platforms and tools and things to use in order to sort of walk yourself through this process in a very systematic way. So um, there is a lot of res great resources out there, but it is something that we need to kind of tweak and modify and really apply so that into conservation so that we, we are using it as well. Yes, and this I think the next question touches on that a bit as well, less about the illegal wildlife trade, but a, a question on your uh, from Tom on your opinion of the, the current trends or the current thing that we're seeing um, influences on Instagram and also ordinary members of the public and taking photographs and selfies with wildlife. Um, and mm -hmm. so they, we in, in, the, in this business know that this isn't a good idea, but somehow that our conservationist voices aren't as loud. So. Uh, how what is your opinion on that and, and how would you go about uh, making sure that conservation voices became as loud yeah so it's it's a good question and it's it's a bit of this sort of debate as to like what what should conservationists do like do we fight fire with fire like do we use these same sort of you know like what i did in my work is do we use targeted advertising in a world that is now inundated with targeted advertising in order to get our messages above the organic posts that are potentially you know, anti-conservation? Now, I would say it in, in terms of these this multitude of organic posts that you see, for example, on people posting selfies with wildlife, it's, a, it's an interesting question. And we wonder, 
as a scientist, you really have to, to sort of step back though and sort of also wonder, I, I'm sure it does have an impact, but how much is it really impacting the consumer market? Um, and you, I think that it's good for us to not jump too quickly to assume that this, this influence of selfies is driving things like wildlife trade because they have done, you know, there was a study by Diago Verismo, for example, who found that he's done a few studies like this where they found that, you know, the push for owls after Harry Potter was actually a myth that the Harry Potter craze of owls didn't actually lead to an increase in owl um, pet trade in the UK. So there is, you know, some things are going to be influenced, but, but we can't assume that it's influencing it necessarily in the way that we think it is. So it is possible that selfies, and it's probably very likely that it's, as you say, it's normalizing this type of behavior of getting close to an animal. But does it lead to an, in, has it definitely led to an increase in people maybe seeking out this wildlife in product or this wildlife animal that they want to take a selfie with? Or was that behavior maybe already there? Like, you know, we've known for a long time, and as you've, John can attest this in Thailand, like, how long has the idea of standing next to a tiger or something and getting a picture been in existence? Quite a while. So I'm not, I would just, it's very, it's possible that it has led to an increase, but we don't know for sure unless we test that. Perfect, thank you. Um, yes, that makes sense, I suppose. People, and also yeah, kids, I'm, I was thinking about um, the, the, the current thing for kids in, in India, particularly to go and, yeah, young young men often drunk in India to go and try, try and take a photograph with their, uh, with a wild elephant. I, they've presumably been chasing the elephants long before they were taking photographs of themselves doing it. Um, so yes, we'd have to test that before we jump to conclusions that it was uh, that it was actually increasing that behaviour. So it's, that's good. Okay, and Yoganand is asking, could you demonstrate through any subsequent work any actual reduction on the purchase of? Oh, so this is the behavioural change. Did you demonstrate any, that there was any behavioural change, or is there is there work in the pipeline to demonstrate or to to test that rather than just self pledges, which may disappear in the time it takes to type them. <laughs> yeah, so that was what we did through our follow-up evaluation. And yeah, I won't discuss that too much because it's in press, but we found that we found some interesting contradicting information in that if you looked at the pop, if you looked at like before and after the intervention, we didn't see a significant decrease in high-level users. But when assessing between the target audience and the non-target audience, we could definitely see that the target audience was significantly impacted more than the non-target audience. And there was also, and high level users within that audience were the most impacted. So it's kind of an interesting result. And we're not really, there's a number of reasons why that may have come to come to be. And one of it can also, could be just the timing of the evaluation. So the evaluation was done about two months after the intervention, but this is the type of product that you don't necessarily use every day. You know, you only use it when you're feeling sick. So it's very likely that you just, the, sh the shift in consumer preferences is likely just going to take longer. And so we could see that that was happening through the intervention, but we just hadn't gotten to like the full scale of people starting to shift their behavior. And also, as we do know that interventions do take a lot of time and often that you do need repeated interventions in order to have a cumulative effect that's gonna be seen on a scale say across an entire country. But if you look at a nuance, you can see that there are changes happening. So, but yes, you definitely need to do it through evaluation. <laughs> okay, and I think that actually might have answered, but I'm not going to not going to tell you it answered just in case you have another answer to the, the next question, which is um, from Eric. Um, Eric Lau is asking, what or if you mentioned earlier that uh, these methods don't necessarily hit the the, the really dedicated users, um, do, would you suggest any alternative methods or um, or or just just keep repeating until eventually it, it gets there? Uh, would that be effective also? Yeah, I mean it's po so it's going to be a a mix of things, and there are alternative methods to use and and. So I would say like, so we use this kind of social endorsement, basically, it's really a socially framed message. And if you are a super hardcore user, and it doesn't matter, you know, to hell or high water, if anyone tells you differently, you're going to do this behavior, then for that individual likelihood, the only thing that's going to change your behavior is availability. If this product 
is regulated in a way that it's no longer accessible to you, then, or it's priced out of your availability, then, then that's one way to, to reduce consumption. And you've seen that through things like um, sugar taxes, where they didn't, they didn't make it illegal, they have just made some of these products more expensive, and therefore they've kind of reduced users' preferences or, or, sorry, users' willingness to purchase these products just because they don't want to pay more. So there are different ways that you can kind of can kind of get around, and you can also even be more subtle. Like if if the social perspective isn't um, working, which you know it won't in, in in different instances. You know, it depends on the behavior. You can do things as we've said, like these more subtle nudging techniques, where you reframe the product in in its in the store with how it is being described. So then all of a sudden it doesn't necessarily appear like maybe what you thought it was going to appear like. So, or, or it's in a different location, so it's less convenient for you. So there's all these kind of things that can influence and do influence our behavior that don't even really require you thinking that you're making a different choice. You're just sort of making a different choice because of the circumstance. Perfect. Well. Thank you very much. I think that's uh, that's all the questions. If anybody else has has any more, Zach, please type them very very quickly. Um, so all that remains to me to say, apart from to, to thank you for for your work, because um, even for I mean it's actually rare that a uh, study um, study like this, which was an essentially an experiment and part of your PhD to see what was going to happen, actually had a had a massive or it seems to have had a massive positive impact even if it, we don't know it's long term yet but a short term impact on the site on an endangered species so uh, so long may you do more experiments like this to, to your to your second phd uh, or, or however it moves on or your or your on your students ongoing um so very very good to hear about it and um yes definitely a lot of food for thought there not only in the illegal wildlife trade but in a lot of other things that we do um and and we have to get through for for information and and also very fascinating to see how uh, how we have to be very very careful on the on the negative side and how how we may be being manipulated which i think is something that the, the world needs to to learn a little bit as well so um yes <laughs> a, a fascinating insight thank you very much um all that remains now is for me to thank our sponsors Anantara Golden Triangle if you happen to we are open if you happen to be in Thailand and fancy coming to see some elephants and and they are already captive so taking a selfie with them is is not not necessarily a problem we'll make sure it's done it's done well and, but all that remains is for me to thank Anantara Golden Triangle who won't have me it's going dark here so I definitely can't see any elephants um slightly less scientific and more rambly uh tomorrow we are actually going to start do our start restart our lockdown live streams uh, tomorrow morning at 7 30 hour time I will be streaming out um here on Facebook and again at 4 p.m on friday so do join me for those if you want to just meet the elephants and uh, and we can chat elephants and we might chat a little bit about this talk but um uh, i won't be anywhere near as accurate and scientific as hunter was um so that's uh, that's that's i think all we have so thank you once again hunter um been a fantastic talk thank you to our audience thank you for all the questions um and oh i don't know if we're going to have an, an elephant professional next week um our our original speaker has has pushed back a bit because they're having some trouble putting the putting the slides together but we may have i'm trying to line up something on um on human elephant conflict an elephant a smelly elephant repellent which is um beginning to show some good results in uganda and maybe applicable for the rest of the uh, the rest of the world so we'll try and bring you a smelly elephant person uh next week and uh, now she's definitely going to have she sees that she's definitely going to say no i'm not talking to you um so uh but if not we will be back uh the wednesday after next um with our own lecture i will keep you posted on the facebook so that's it thank you very much hunter thank you very much everybody thanks and, everybody uh, we will see you uh, see you next time